Hey, 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 it's Chaos Queen here, and you're listening to the Geek Cast Radio Network. There's nothing wrong with your podcast player. Do not attempt to adjust the volume. Hello and welcome back into our studio. You are now inside Studio 2009, only on the GeekCast Radio Network. I'm, of course, TFG on Mike, and joining me for this 40th anniversary celebration of Beverly Hills Cop and the release of the fourth film, BHCAF, because BHC as fuck, uh, are the Taggart and Rosewood to my Jeffrey Friedman. It's Steve Megatron. Hello, sir. Yo. And Dragon Lord Kai. You guys can pick which character you want to be. I, I kind of I kind of think I was going to say Steve's Rosewood. <laughs> and Tiger, and yeah, I can yeah. Tiger, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and hello, <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Uh, yeah. So, Beverly Hills Cop, Axel Foley, fourth film. It took thirty years to do, but I understand. But I remember when we started the network back in two thousand nine. There were rampant rumors and everything and all this and all that. And I'm like, and we were just like, it ain't never going to happen. <laughs> no, I figured it was going to happen. I, cause well, I was reading the rumors for years. It was like Keaton coming back to play Batman. Like, right. Secretly I knew. Mm-hmm. And on top of it, just the, uh, the Oracle in me. Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. Predicted. Mm-hmm. That there shall be a day that it shall pass. Yes, um, and July third, as as we've already found out, because we're in the future at this point. But July third is the day, or was the day for twenty twenty four. Oh man! So Steve wasn't born yet when the first movie came out. I was four. Kai was four. I did not see the first film. The eighties was weird for me as a kid. I always ended up seeing sequels before the first ones. I saw Ghostbusters 2 before I saw Ghostbusters. I saw Beverly Hills Cop 2 before I saw Beverly Hills Cop. And I love the second film. I have always loved the second film. The first film is great. It it is. But that second film, man, just... Just... Wow. Hello there! You has reached the home of George Kingfish Stevens. I'm sorry I'm not in now, but I done gone down to the lodge hall. But if you like, you can leave a message at the tone and I'll get back to you at my earliest inconvenience. So for me, I saw Beverly Hills Cop 2 first when I was a kid because I would be old enough to remember that one. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop 1, I didn't see till I was a little bit older. I remember going to see it in the drive-in theater. Which, nice. you know, for some of those that don't remember those, those were fun days where you sit in your car and have a good time and watch it all. and Or don't watch it all and have a good time in your car. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what a lot of people did. Too. Exactly. 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 There, there was options. We'll just say drive there in, was options. Drive in, take out. Yeah, there was options <laughs> there. And, uh, I always loved it. Um, Billy was my favorite uh, side character with Axel Foley just because two really made him shine. I think Yes, he yes. really, yeah. I, I mean, I love Taggart saying quote unquote F Rambo during that one scene yeah. <laughs> when he uh, blows up that truck with the rocket launcher. Cause it fires the wrong way. That yeah. just, that screams Billy to me. And so, I've loved Beverly Hills Cop since I was a kid. And three for me was just not really as good. Um, It was good that it had Billy in it, but it just didn't feel the same without Taggart. That that was the big thing for me that it just didn't feel the same. I mean, the new actor that came in, and I'm blanking on his name, he was a comedian. Um, Hector Elizondo, he was, yeah. He was okay, but. It just, it still just didn't have the feel that the other ones did. It wasn't until, like, I like Hector Elizondo. Steve will talk about him because he was on Last Man Standing with uh, Tim Allen and all that. But I like him as an actor. 
But the best part of three with him is at the end when they're all injured and Billy comes in and falls over and he just and just uh, his character Alessandro's character just laughs at him because Billy's literally got bullet holes throughout his entire body and he falls over uh, and Axel starts poking um, Alessandro's character in the shoulder. He's like, <coughs> "Don't touch that." Uh, three was all right. Three was okay. Three was. Transition because it was 1994, and in the from the 80s to the 90s, movies changed. Like the like the 80s was very comedy, but it was also very gritty with a lot of films, whether it was action or whatever kind of stuff or horror, whatever the hell it is. But the 90s, they tried to go more comedy, and the plot of three is just gen- it, it, like it's so generic. It's like oh. Corrupt cop goes to blah, 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 Wonder World, hides out, blah, 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 or corrupt federal agent or whatever the hell Fulbright was. Not Fulbright. Um, the other guy. Whatever the other guy's name was. Anyway. But, uh, but yeah, two is where it's at. What about you, Steve? I mean, what's not to love about the series? Like, I I love this way more than I, like, Lethal Weapon and things like that. Mm-hmm. Like this was this was kind of my uh, you, you had the comedy of Axel Foley, you know, Eddie Murphy, the mm-hmm. the dynamic of him coming from Detroit, uh, yep. which is, you know, 45 minutes from my hometown. Yep. Uh, so. I I really enjoyed getting to kind of experience it. And yeah, I mean, I saw them obviously way after they came out. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, I mean, I grew up on 80s programs anyway, mm-hmm. just because that was kind of yep. the the bread and butter in my house. Like, we always... I mean, I grew up on some 90s stuff, too. But for the most part, I mean, it was it was a lot of 80s comedies and 80s action films. And so, like, Arnold was really cool in my house. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then you had, like, oh, you had the Adam Sandlers in the group and... uh you know, uh, various other, you know, action stars. And so, I don't know, I just, uh, Eddie Murphy was another one of those that just kind of, uh, mm-hmm. the Beverly Hills cop, like, he he stood out. Yep, absolutely. And you bring up Adam Sandler, and you know what the sad thing is? The other day, for a couple of years now, I don't know, more than a couple of years now, but for about five or six years now, <clears throat> Normally, I don't drink Gatorade because I don't like most of the flavors they have. But they did this Gatorade Zero Frosted Cherry or uh, Glacier Cherry is what it's called. And it's this, like, cherry-flavored Gatorade whatever. And I bought a couple of bottles of it the other, like, last month. And I'm like, Gatorade, water sucks. It really, really sucks. <laughs> yep. Because, you know, like, again, it's... It, the 80s and 90s there were a time where things were timeless. Like, you Correct. know, uh, banana in the tailpipe. Perfect example. You are not going to see a banana in the tailpipe joke today because nobody knows how to do a joke like that and pull it off and have it be funny without, you know, getting somebody offended. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Yeah, blow it out your tailpipe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, the whole dynamic. I mean, Eddie Murphy is an incredible comedian and actor. Mm-hmm. I've liked him in damn near everything he's been in. I mean, yep. it was a shame when he really kind of stopped doing a lot of stuff for a while. But I think it had something to do with that. He was taking time to raise his kids and stuff. And he yeah. wasn't doing as much, which I'm going to say that's commendable. That's something that a lot of people should do. But for me, I think he's always outshined in Beverly Hills Cop. I mean, Absolutely. Axel Foley fits him so well from his comedy days when he did Raw and yep. Boomerang and, and a lot of those. It just, that feels like that character's almost embodied because, yeah, he's going to have fun and do some really stupid things, but at the same time, he's a serious cop yep. and he's not trying to hurt anybody, especially at the beginning with the whole, uh, like I said, oh. man and tailpipe or yeah. taking him to the strip club, which, you know, yeah. he was having fun Three. with them trying to bond. And then, yeah. then he sees a crime getting ready to happen. So of course, you know, 
he he's, get, puts on the serious face. Yep. Yeah. He, yeah. And that's how he's been in every one of the movies. So that's something I've always really liked. It was yeah. a nice time to be funny and then switch off. Like in t- two, he called Gerald uh, or Taggart Gerald Ford in that yep. other club, <laughs> which was funny. Yep. And the yep, whole yep, pool yep. thing, every time he was, and every time he put on a little scene, so he stole that house in Beverly Hills Cop 2. He stole yeah. a hotel room in Beverly Hills Cop <laughs> 1, putting on these little scams that he had, which was absolutely hilarious. Yeah, he well, stole... I, he, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, sorry. Well, I mean, I loved when he, he did it when he was in the hotels and, you know, mm-hmm. Hi, blah, blah, blah. And, like, he would just play this, like, victim. Yep. No matter what happened. And it was just entertaining yep. to watch... And the craziest thing was, at the end of the first film, and we're going to get into the fourth film later, folks, because we want to give you enough buffer time, and we will be putting a spoiler warning when we get to the fourth film. We're not going to discuss the fourth film just yet. But the funny thing is, in the first movie, at the end of the movie, he's like, here, Taggart, I want you to have this Beverly Palm robe. He's like, no, actually, you keep it. He goes, I got three of them in my bag. (laughs) You know, and he goes to... Uh, the hotel people go to give him the bill without even asking. He says nothing. Taggart turns to the hotel clerk. Oh, the Beverly Hills Police Department is going to pick up the tab on this. Are you kidding me? Like, no police department can pick up a hotel tab in Beverly Hills, even if it is the Beverly Hills Police Department. That's just... And I get it. It's a part of the writing, and it's a part of the comedy, and that's fine. But, like, he didn't even have to ask. He, I don't think he was going to say anything. I, I think they were just going to walk out. I don't think he was going to pay at all. I think he was going to come up with some other scheme if Taggart didn't didn't say that. Um, I agree he would have. Yeah. I have seen the second film in the last... Well, it's been 40 years since the first film. Uh, 37 years since the yeah the, I think the 37 38 since the second film I watch the second film at least once every three years because the second film is my favorite film it has everything it has the Falter Meyer score that they started in the first one but then you add in Bob Seger's Shakedown and Neutron Dance and everything else and it's like this is a complete action comedy and it was just so fun. For me, the third movie, I agree it's not, it, like we already said. But what I liked about it was the fact that it... The thing about these movies is it moves the character of Axel and shows him growing each one. By the third movie... Inspector Todd, his boss in Detroit, ends up getting killed by Ellis DeWalt. And the last thing that Todd says to him is, What do you want, a coffee break, Axel? Go get that son of a bitch. And the dude dies. And then obviously he goes out to Wonder World and does the whole Disney thing with Uncle Dave, Walt Disney, blah, 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 whatever. And that was it. And it was fine because it kind of ended on like, you know, kind of ended on a, hey, balloons, everybody say, you know, Axel and everybody save the day. Okay, fine. They did, and I'm not looking this up directly, but I know they were going to do a television series. I'm glad they never did one because a movie character, characters that are written for movies specifically do not always need to try to translate to the small screen and be a TV show. And I don't... Like, Beverly Hills Cop is not Law & Order. Beverly Hills Cop is not NYPD Blue. Beverly Hills... I could insert whatever other cop show, you you know, whatever you want, want me to say here. But, like, that's not what it is. It's specific moments in Axel Foley's life as he's evolved and grown up and blah, 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 blah throughout his police career. That's what it is. And the fact that it took 30 years, okay, but at least we're here. And at least we now have the fourth film, and we know there's going to be a fifth film. So, you know. And like I said earlier, Eddie wasn't going to do it unless it was done right. And I've seen several interviews with him on YouTube and stuff with various whatever outlets that are interviewing him. He specifically said... 
The only way he would come back is if the story was really good and the script was really good and they got Judge Reinhold and John Ashton back as Roseweed and Taggart. So, you know, as long as that happens, hey, I'm here for it. I do also think, though, that, and this is with any franchise, not just Beverly Hills Cop, there is a cutoff point. There is a point where, okay, you've done this, this is cool, this is enough. If there wasn't going to be a fifth film, the end of the fourth film, I'm more than fine leaving Axel Foley, you know, letting him, you know, ride off into the sunset or whatever now at this point. That's fine. That's not, but like, um, we haven't talked about this yet. We will in the future here on Studio 2009, but Bad Boys for Life and Bad Boys Ride or Die. I haven't seen the fourth Bad Boys film yet. I plan to. I'm not judging it. But after that third film, I'm like, okay, if they were going to hang it up, let them hang it up here and be fine. Because you, not everything has to be a freaking franchise, folks. Not everything has to be a 23-film cinematic universe not saying that that's bad i'm just saying everything has its place and beverly hills cop has never been to me where it was like it needed 25 sequels unless but, I, wanted to do it. but i'll interject on that one uh, the uh-huh. biggest problem is with hollywood it's it's all about the reboots i, I mean and trying to find okay. some new script and i am glad that it was eddie murphy in the original cast and not some Beverly Hills cop reboot. I mean, granted it was 40 years later, but 40 years later, it still had flavor to it. Whereas, and I know we'll talk more about it, but most sequels that are 30, 40 years aren't near as good. Or if they're a reboot or a send off or something, it, it makes it really difficult and it's really hard to gauge how good something's going to be nowadays. So something like this, I was skeptical until I saw the trailer. Oh man. All right. So let's Steve, do you have any thoughts really quickly before I go into my trailer talk? Because I have a lot to say about both of the trailers. <laughs> no. Okay, so they released the teaser, okay? I don't know what the timestamp is on the teaser, but they released the teaser, and it starts off, and it does its thing, and it goes into going back to Cali Cali by Notorious B.I.G. and everything else, and all this and all that. And I'm, like... I didn't even know. I like. I figured it out because it's kind of easy to figure out. It's not a spoiler for me to say. If you watch that first trailer and you see it open up and you see Foley in there with Kevin Bacon's character, Captain Grant, and as soon as he opens his mouth and says, "All these years you've been running and gunning," doesn't it? Don't you? Aren't you tired? I'm like, okay, that's the villain. That, like, I didn't even need like. I know Kevin Bacon is the villain of this film. I don't know what's going to happen, but as soon as I saw that teaser, I was like, okay, uh uh-huh. And I will fully admit, because I have been waiting for this for, we've all been waiting for this for 30 years, that the day that that first teaser came out, I sat here and I just kept hitting replay. Replay. I probably watched it a hundred times the first day it was released. And I know that's silly to most people, because it's just a trailer, but it's an exciting time because holy crap, we're getting a, we're getting another adventure with Axel Foley, and then the second trailer comes out, and I'm just like, okay, you guys have got it, just absolutely one done everything, and the biggest thing for me in that second trailer, one of the female cops that's in there, she goes. Foley? And all of a sudden you hear Paul Reiser. Did you Foley? Did you say Foley? I'm like, oh hell yes, because Jeffrey was always such a great character. And again, this fourth film shows that all of the characters in this universe have grown up. So 
We are going to be doing spoilers right now, folks. If you have not seen Beverly Hills Cop, Axel Foley, stop the podcast, go watch the movie, and come back. You have been warned. Uh, 40 years, four films. This is going to be a blast, trust me. It just is. <laughs> so, where do we want to start, Steve? Probably at the beginning. Well, ha, 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 funny guy. I'm uh, just burning doing the neutron dance. Yes, yes, you are. Uh, so we got Eddie Murphy, obviously, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Taylor Page, Judge Reinhold, John Ashton, Paul Reiser, Bronson Pinchot, and Kevin Bacon as the main stars of the movie. And I will say that this plot nothing there's nothing in hollywood or nothing in entertainment today that doesn't have tropes or standards or plot types that we haven't seen before it just depends on how you write the characters and how you write the story this somebody could look at this and say oh that's an episode of law and order or whatever kind of thing but the thing of it is is that we see the character of axel foley and how much he's grown and how much he's been through and and all of that and <laughs> yeah we in a goddamn snowplow what's the problem <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing was great i mean yeah it was so my first thoughts when i first saw it was i loved the intro they did really good with the intro um you got the heat is on so you got one of the classic songs playing while he is going driving around and you can see that he's still doing his thing being a cop and being a smart ass with people which is great and of course like everybody flipping him off and stuff it's great and just it gave me that old original vibe with it and it just it was very reminiscent of the old days for me well and i loved where the radio kicked on when he's in the snowplow and you have the dj in detroit you know talking about the you know stay off the roads unless you're going to a red wings game and then uh <laughs> and then uh he's like here's another classic and then it you know it's playing music from the original but it was just mm-hmm. kind of funny how it came up like it was yeah. like in universe, not just like a overlay, right? Um, yeah, and and so that was entertaining. But I also love the fact that he roped in his uh, the other police officer that they were going to the game to, oh, and, Mike uh, Woody, and he roped him in like, uh, <laughs> oh look, you just discovered the criminals for blah blah blah. I've and never like, laughed so <laughs> damn hard on that one. <laughs> I was like, he just set up the whole thing like this yeah. machination to get his way because he was. They were like, I thought you were taking off the case. Oh, I was. That's why you're going to discover it. Yeah, right. I I laughed at the start of that, it, and then first thing he does is calls his wife because he's so excited instead of calling it in like you said. I just like, okay, this this is priceless. Guys, calling it in. Hey, honey, guess what? I'm on a police chase with Axel Foley. I meant call it in. <laughs> that part just cracked me up with that one. Yeah. And then he was like, and when uh, when his uh, old partner, Friedman, uh, who's, yep. who's the police chief, I can't remember his name because he's like a big Jeffrey part, Friedman. But, yep, yep. Yeah. he's not anyway, a big part. Stop it. Uh, Riser, is that what it is? Yep, Paul Riser, the actor. Yep. yep, yep. Yeah. So Friedman, he uh, he's like. Um, Oh, he, it's it's Axel, and he's like, he didn't discover nothing. He hasn't solved the case in like X five years. years. Yep. Yeah, but it was hilarious just how that kind of came about. And then he's the just like, I'm I'm going good night because <laughs> yeah, he just yeah, gave he up does. at that one point because, <laughs> like, because he knows because Jeffrey knows he knows what Axel is going to do. He knows the craziness that is Axel Foley. He's known yep. for thirty years. Did you say Foley? And he knows Axel's right. It's just all the other bullshit it's his politics. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's his methods, obviously, yes. But, like, and they and they even talk about that after, like, this isn't like 30 years ago where we can just kind of explain this away. And, like, you didn't have a scene where 
uh, Rosewood expl- or, yeah, Rosewood explains the whole thing to the chief, and then the chief turns to Taggart and he goes, Sergeant Taggart, what really happened? And Taggart's That's pretty like, much how it happened. Oh, happened just like you <laughs> said, Chief. Like, because, you know, and it's just so cool and so good. And yeah, I couldn't I, stop laughing at that. Yeah. From start to finish of that movie, it had its serious points, but it was just high adrenaline, but also so many laughs. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first, he goes into the locker room and pretends to be a, a disgruntled <laughs> hockey player wanting to jump in. <laughs> and I was cracking up and they're just like, who the blank are you? And then he kicks mm-hmm. their butts. I'm like, okay, this is hilarious. This, mm-hmm. this is, this is priceless. This is classic Axel that yep. everybody knows and loves. Yep. And to me, it it had a very good story start to it. I mean, mm-hmm. so since we're on the spoiler section, Jeffrey, what? you know, gets yelled at, basically covering for Axel, and he decides he's going to retire. It's time. And he's trying to console with Axel to consider his daughter because mm-hmm. Axel hasn't seen his daughter in a lot mm-hmm. of years. And Jeffrey is really falling on his sword uh, on to save Axel this time. Cause you know, he says that they don't want action, you know, basically action cops anymore. They just want social workers, social workers, which, you know, kind of, you know, it's kind of true. Actually. It, it really, that resonated with me. Cause it's like, yeah. okay, he's battling, Time times have changed that people don't like police as much anymore. Be, I'm not saying that. I'm just talking about the political. I, I know habits. what you're saying. Yeah, no, no, they, no, I know, I know what you're saying. Today's times. So mm-hmm. for me, it was like, yeah, I can see how this is all played out here because you know times have changed and Axel hasn't changed with the times. He's still, you know the lone wolf or a wild guy that will do whatever it takes to solve the case, even break a few fractions of the law, like in Mm -hmm. Beverly Hills cop too, as he would say. (laughs) So to me, it played very well with, okay, it's 40 years and so much has changed in the police world. And so when he finally gets that call to help Billy, uh, Billy, in my opinion, that it showed the dynamic of how close they still stayed for 40 years, even being outside, you know, Detroit and Beverly Hills and Mm -hmm. how Billy was still basically playing spy for (laughs) Baxel with his daughter because he still always wanted to keep tabs on his daughter, even though his daughter hated him. So Absolutely. it showed that he still cared, but he was also still tied very much to the job. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And you look at Judge Reinhold's uh, filmography here. I would say the most famous breakthrough for him was playing Private Elmo Blum in Stripes in 1981. He was in Fast Times at Richmond High after that. The Lords of Discipline after that. Gremlin. He was in Gremlins. That's right. He was Gerald Hopkins in Gremlins. Wow. He yeah. had Gremlins and Beverly Hills Cop both in 84. Holy crap. Roadhouse 66. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop 2. Vice versa. Soldiers. Blah, blah, blah. Daddy's Training place. Or not training places. Uh, it was the one with Fred Savage. That was a good one. Where they oh, used wow. the skull and body swapped. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And then in 1994, again, 30 years ago, which means that, Steve, for Christmas this year, we have to cover the franchise, uh, he did t- Dr. Neil Miller in the Santa Claus movies, and that basically oh, yeah. showed everybody that he has the chops a- as an actor and 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 everything else, and he's been in a bunch of stuff since then. And obviously now they're back with... Uh, with uh with BHCIF. But yeah, no, like Rosewood as a character was always so good. <laughs> I agree. You can never have too much firepower. 
My Jesus, favorite, Billy. Dude, Billy we we got to talk. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> we're like in this one where you know he's handed a pistol at one point. It's like, what am I supposed to do with this? Shoot it, Billy! And, like, <laughs> and then he just picks up the AK that's laying there instead. He's yeah. like, "This is what we're talking about." <laughs> yeah, this is yeah, yeah. Billy's uh, it's kind of like the line in the in in the truck. Uh, we on the edge, you know. Fuck a seatbelt. We on the edge. It's like, mm-hmm, that's, God, that's I missed you, way. Axel. Yeah, that's right. It, oh, the one threat that I had is I didn't feel like there was enough Billy or Taggart. That's the one thing that I wish there could have been a little bit more of. I understand for the plot purposes, but I do mm-hmm. hope in a, in the sequel there is more of them. But I also understand they are much older today. So that yeah. may not be as possible due to their age. So the funny thing, so again, the fir- from the first two films to the fourth film, with Taggart and Rosewood, Again, just like Foley's character, they're all growing up. They're whatever. Yes, Taggart is the oldest of them all, and Billy and 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 Axel are the same age. Uh, but uh, Taggart always was like, "Oh, I'm retiring. Oh, I'm doing this." Or, "Oh, I'm get." He was always that old, gristled white cop. And I'm not saying that to be racist or anything. It's just a <laughs> fact of what his character was. Yeah, and. He's always, oh, Maureen left me, or we got back together. I never needed to see Mrs. Taggart. I never needed to see Maureen. And we see Maureen in this, and barely. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, I know it's, I know it's barely. It's, it's like half a scene or like whatever, because he's on the treadmill there. Um, but it's just one of those things where it's kind of like, um, uh, uh, Vera, it's kind of like Vera, Vera Peterson in Cheers. You never needed to see Norm's wife. You knew Norm's wife was, <laughs> right? You know, kind of thing. And again, like Steve said, it's a, it, it's, it's a, it's a very, very small scene. But like you said, Kai, they're all older. They're all whatever. And I think the reason why you didn't see as much Rosewood and Taggart in this is because of the way the story was structured for this, where. Taggart is the Beverly Hills Police Department chief, and Rosewood is out doing private eye stuff. Right. And they has the, the, come back went, together. Yeah. Right. And like I said, my hope is that, you know, in the next one, since there that is in production, there is more of them. But I also understand age makes a difference. They're not spring chickens anymore. Uh, the actor that plays Taggart's 76 years old and yeah, John Ashton and judge Reynolds is 67. 67. Now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and Eddie's only what? 63. Yeah. That, yeah. But he, he looks still like he's in his like fifties. He does. Yeah. I was impressed. That's why, with that's how why well that he joke aged. with, uh, with, uh, uh, Jeffrey. Mm-hmm. He's like, man, can you believe we are the same age? Mm-hmm. He's like, he looked old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's more of... Uh, you're right, Steve, but I think that's more of... I mean, it was an in-universe joke, but it was still right, funny. Right, no. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not saying it's not funny. I'm just saying, like, yeah, it's an in-universe joke. It's a thing, a thing, a thing. And it's one of those things where they both have been through a lot. And we talk, and then they talk about uh, how Jeffrey doesn't like his psychopathic grandson. And I laughed when I saw that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, was, that, was, that was hilarious. Um, but, I mean, yeah, and Eddie's career... I mean, he's done so many different things, and he's been able to be in things that are separate from this universe. That are it's like he's got the Nutty Professor stuff. He's got Shrek like, with Donkey, and now they have a standalone coming yep. out that's just yep. Donkey. Yep. So I mean, yep. yeah, they're doing an untitled fifth Shrek film, which I personally think is unneeded because after the fourth one, they kind of left it off on a on a whatever. But hey, if they want to do a fifth one, fine, whatever. Uh, like you said, the untitled donkey film, which is going to be interesting, I think. And I'm I remember- with you on that. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't really feel like you really need it, yeah. but it's going to happen. Yeah. It's just like, and and to me, this was maybe also a redemption arc 
for how bad Beverly Hills Cop Three was. I mean, I'm not saying it was I like, like it was that bad. I, I it wasn't it was a lot of crap, but I mean, but it wasn't as good as two, one and two. But it yeah, still had I a mean, charm. But but look at Die Hard four and five. Yeah, <laughs> or or Lethal Weapon four. Yeah, I, I mean, agree with you on that. But I, I feel like I. But I feel like that's partially too why Eddie didn't want to reprise, right? Until it was done how he wanted it. Correct. With a legit story, not just a cash grab. Something mm-hmm. fun, something in universe, something that made sense. Yep. Yeah, and I agree with you, and I think that's why he did it as well. Because yeah, it it just wasn't as good as as one and two, and he even knew that. I, I mean, that's why he didn't come back for it, a long it time. Was, it was, okay. So we have a zero to five with half point scale here at the GCR, and we call it the Geeko Meter because we're renaming it now. Uh, and if I was going to rank the first three films, one and two are easily fives. The third film I would probably put at a 3 or a 3.5, which is not a bad ranking. You guys can see the if you click on the thing in the in the post description on geekcastradio.com, you can see all the descri- all the descriptions of wh- how we break down the geekometer here at the Geekcast Radio network and all that. But after I watched the fourth film, I went back and I watched the other three films, and I still absolutely love certain parts of that third film. That like we already discussed uh, with G- and this fourth film I knew this was going to be good like you said with Axel with, with Eddie coming back and wanting to really do it also Jerry Brockheimer I don't remember the last time Jerry Brockheimer had a bad movie that no, dude I... puts out stuff like just <laughs> Hell, so, one of my favorite movies from him still is Falling Down with uh, mm-hmm. uh, Michael, Douglas. Michael Douglas yeah Yep, I was gonna say Kirk Douglas. I was like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, that's wrong. <laughs> so, but, as as a producer, Brockheimer from 1980 to 2022, American Gigolo, Flashdance, Beverly Hills Cop, Thief of Hearts, Top Gun, Cop Two, Days of Thunder, Gemini Man, Top Gun Maverick, and Secret Headquarters in 2022. So I, I gotta but, stop you a little bit. Yes. His stuff that he's done with Don Simpson, yes, has, has all been good. Yes, the stuff that he's had Jerry Bruckheimer films without him right. from '97 to present, well, as it's progressively gotten later. Yeah, basically after he broke 2010, uh huh, the films got progressively worse. Okay, I I do agree with that. Separately, but from yes, but from let's say, uh, D- uh, so again, under Walt Disney Studios Motion Pictures, The Ref in 1994, Crimson Tide and Dangerous Minds in '95, The Rock, Con Air, Armageddon, Enemy of the State, Coyote Ugly, Gone in 60 Seconds, Remember the Titans, Pearl Harbor, Bad Company. The first Pirates movie in 2003, National Treasure one and two, Deja Vu. You're uh, literally listing a ton of movies yeah, that know. are so good. Well, and that's it, but that's I know that's saying. that's my point, and and that's Steve's point. These are all movies before 2010, and in 2010, everything after Hyman, 2010 was was kind of crap, and yeah. especially when it came to a Disney production. Yeah. And to me, that kind of speaks volumes. That I, it's not him per se. I think he just got the short end of the stick and being stuck with crap productions and crap crap yeah. scripts that nobody wanted. But I I think it's funny that every time Don Simpson Jerry Bruckheimer films are together, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they've got almost a slam dunk on every every one. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, think, yeah. So, I mean, without, and I'm not going to name all the films, but yeah, every, yeah, pretty much everything after 2010 on his own has been crap. So when you bring up Disney, it also depends on how much creative authority he had to True. change things compared to, say, more independent, like with him working with Eddie Murphy on this one. How much freedom did he really have with Disney? Because, I mean... Disney really puts the thumb down on a lot of their 
Well, they want creative control, and that's part of the issue too. But the the yeah. funny thing here is that we also have Eddie Murphy Productions on mm-hmm. this film. Yes, um, and it's distributed by Netflix. And Netflix, although they don't tell anybody what their stuff makes, they generally play in the nostalgia realm. Uh, yeah. They like nostalgia. They like things that are likely going to sell. They also like the fact that, you know, like they did Fuller House. They did, you know, they've done this film. They've done some various other things that are kind of, you know, having Adam Sandler with his entire catalog because they were like, hey, people watch the crap out of it. Even if they suck, people watch the crap out of it, Mm -hmm. you know? So to me, that speaks that they're, they're like, what are people actually watching? Not yeah. not necessarily what are the numbers, what are the what is keeping people subscribed? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the thing about Brockheimer and Simpson, unfortunately, Simpson died young. He was 52. He died in 1996. So Oh wow. Yeah, so Jerry so Brockheimer that fi- company portion yeah. evidently knows what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I mean, again, it's just one of those things where, like we already said, and like Eddie has said and everybody else, as long as it's a good script, they're going to do it. And as long as he can still do it, they're going to do it. There's no, like, but but again, as I said also, it's like, there's also a stopping point. It's okay if you stop. It's okay if there isn't a fifth, I mean, there's going to be a fifth, but it's okay if there isn't going to be a sixth or a seventh film, etc., etc. Because sometimes you got to leave the characters somewhere. And again, if there wasn't going to be a BHC five, I think at the end of this movie was a good stop point. It was was a good, yeah, it was, it was okay. And I will say that all the people and all the actors had Mm -hmm. such great chemistry together. There was a list of great actors with this. The plot was, solid there was i didn't really see anything that really screamed oh my god i hate this or it didn't have a lot of politics and it It was just what i missed with 80s and 90s you got your storyline you've got your emotion you've got your humor you've got the dark parts you've got Mm -hmm. everything that we miss when Mm the 80s and 90s were around for movies and it was so good and that fun it was just a fun movie. And like I told Mike after the review on it, I'm like, this should have been in theaters. This would have done been. very well in theaters compared to what is in the theaters today. This would have made money, especially once it got word around that how good this movie was, people would have went to see it. Thing is, I'm not a theater goer anymore, but I probably would have gone. Same. I may. I think all three of us are in that same boat. The last time I saw anything in theaters was 2018 when Karen and I went to see Transformers the movie when they did the 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 re airing in, in theaters for Transformers the movie. But at the same time, there are movies that if I could get to a theater right now today, which I can't with the way the public transportation is in the town that I live in. Uh, I would go see this in the theaters. I would have gone to see Bad Boys for Life. Uh, uh, Same. The third movie, this fourth movie that that's that's whatever. Uh, like I would have gone to see all of those in theaters. I would have gone to see Bumblebee in theaters. I would have gone to see Rise of the Beasts in theaters. The last one I've gone. seen was Super Mario Brothers, and I would have went to seen this one because it just everything was so good about it. I just, I, I cannot find anything bad with this movie. There was nothing that really bothered me. I mean, I mean, I'm from, not- from oh, I know what you're gonna say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, ignoring you know. that, ignoring uh-huh. that, because it was just the way the character was. Uh-huh. I will say that it was all in all just fun. Absolutely. Something that I missed so much is. The fun element. Yep. When uh, when Geek when we first launched Geekcast Radio, we were doing every now and then on Geekcast Radio, the flagship podcast. We would do. I think we actually only ever did one, 
on that podcast, but we would do actor spotlights and we did an actor spotlight on William Shatner at the time. Yep. And I mean, this whole episode for Studio 2009 is essentially an, an actor spotlight on Judge Reinhold, John Ashton, Eddie Murphy, everybody, et cetera, et cetera. But there's one actor that's in this that is new to this franchise that I've followed almost his entire career, and I kind of want to do a, a spotlight on him, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. This he dude, did fantastic in that role. Yes. I mean, he was spot on. This seemed, for me, I mean, mm-hmm. I've seen him in The Dark Knight Rises when it, yep. he was, I think, Robin. Blake, and he was going to be yep. Robin. But oh, yep. of the, overall... This, I think, was one of his best performances, and they really, really made him shine on this one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So really quickly, and I know I'm going to list a bunch of things here, but I'm going to list all the ones that I know off the top of my head. Uh, He debuted as student number one in the original Beethoven film from 1992, the big dog Beethoven. He then did A River Runs Through It, he did uh, Angels in the Outfield is the first film I actually saw him in. That's with him and Danny Glover and all that stuff and their angels and all that. 25 years ago, he played Cameron James in 10 Things I Hate About You. I have loved that movie for 25 years, and I will continue to love that movie until I die. Uh, he was Jim Hawkins in Treasure Planet, the animated movie, as we already said about uh, some of the other stuff. Uh, I'm trying to see here. He, he, I did not know this. I did not remember this. Steve, he was freaking Rex Lewis slash Cobra Commander in The Rise of Cobra in 2000. I remember that because I absolutely I forgot. hated that film. <laughs> I know. It was I really forgot fire. about that one, too. But, yeah, I hated that one. He was Arthur in Inception. Like we said, he was Robin, quote, John Blake in, in Dark Knight Rises. He was in Looper. He was in Don John. Uh, and this is just his movies. I did not know. Don Juan, I am, by the way. But yeah. No, it says Don John. J-O-N is what it says here. Yeah, it's it like not, Juan. Don Juan. Uh, uh, Anyways. They should spell it right then. Uh, but he was also uh, a voice in Knives Out, which Knives Out is something we're going to cover at some point. I love that movie. His big TV thing was obviously three, th- uh, not three, wow, uh, three, a third rock from the sun with John Lithgow. So Joseph Gordon-Levitt, amazing, amazing actor. He's had such a career. Absolutely love that guy. And you're right, Kai, this movie, that character of Bobby Abbott, He's one hell of a cop shot because, damn, he hit every target. (laughs) Yeah, and, you know, the whole story, you know, going after corrupt cops and stuff, I know that's been, a lot of people say maybe that's been played out, but the way they did it, it really flowed together very well. Absolutely. absolutely. And that's the point that I will say, you can do repeats of stuff story-wise if you make it flow well and make it make sense. Well, and and again, you go from the for the second film to the fourth film. The second film, there was supposed corruption with the mayor and everybody else, but there really wasn't because it was all about the jewel. The second film was like the perception, like oh my god, we needed to look this way or that way with going after the gun runners and the and the jewelry heister and and all this and all that. But this fourth film, and I'm very excited to see what they do for the for the fifth one, to just whatever. But, and I can safely say, folks, since July 3rd, when this movie was released, I think I've watched it four times. <laughs> You're probably going to hear this podcast on July 5th, 2024. So within two days, I've watched this movie four times. It's that damn good. I plan on watching it with my family this week. That's. Yep. I mean, I think my folks are going to love it. They're just watching Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2. The other day, like multiple times, I passed through in the hallway and there was one or two on and they love it, too. And I'm thinking when they see it in July 3rd, they're going to love it. Absolutely. Anything else on this one, Steve? Uh, anything else we need to bring up? Uh, I mean, the story was pretty predictable mm-hmm. as far as the story, because anytime Kevin Bacon shows up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's. Notorious for bad guys. He's he's pretty much synonymous with a bad guy, but yeah, I almost admire you. 
still on these streets. Running and cut it. I'm just amazed. I think the trailer gave that one away. That was the one thing. Because yeah. there was a specific I don't trailer. Away, like just the moment he stepped foot on screen mm-hmm. and he started talking about, you know, how thankless the job was. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, he is the bad guy. Like, yep. but I, but even like the way he carried himself, he just, he has that arrogant, bad persona, mm-hmm. but the other, a character. But, and so like, honestly, I, I knew what we were getting into and it was very much, you know, almost similar to doing Beverly Hills cop one in a lot a of bit. like, it mirrored a lot of elements of it, mm-hmm. but it also gave it a lot of fresh spin and a lot of like just age. Yeah. And for me, the trailer with him holding the gun was the big one, the way it was in that chase. I just I just kind of felt that, oh, he's the bad Because I remember telling you when we were watching the trailer, I said, I think he's the bad guy. And not just because he's known for playing really good bad guys in almost every movie he's been in, but the that and they didn't really make you guess all the way to the end. It was literally within the, what, first 40 minutes? You pretty yeah. much, if you hadn't figured it out from the meeting, when yeah. they follow the bad guys to the hotel roof where they're partying, yeah. then, yeah, then at that point, you're like, oh, well, they really are trying to find a way to put him behind bars, but they don't know how because he's been very sneaky about it all. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and again, you have actors that play villains really, really well. You have actors that play heroes really, really well. You don't necessarily need, like, I get it if you want to, you know, spread your wings and fly and do something else and not always be known as as the villain. That's That's great. And he's done some interesting stuff that is not, where he's not a villain. He did the voice of Balto in the animated film Balto in 95. What's the other one? Um, hmm, wait a minute, where is that movie? I swear, I, I remember that. Why isn't that up here? I swear he was in the air up there, but I could be wrong. Yeah, there it is. He played Jimmy Dolan in the air up there in 1994. It's the one about the American sports cadre. It's about the one where he goes across the across the continent to find a, a superstar basketball player. He was in a bunch of other stuff, and it's just fun. I think he was Jack Brennan in Frost and Nixon, and say what you want about the whole Frost, Nixon, whatever the hell thing. He was another villain in... He's in the X-Men. The fact... Look. We all know about Six Degrees of Set Kevin Bacon. You can find Kevin, you can connect Kevin Bacon to almost anything. And the fact now that he's in Beverly Hills Cop, well, he was. Whoops, spoilers, folks. Not going to say what happens, but um, yeah. Uh, but again, I don't think you needed. Th- this franchise is not about super deep thinking. It's not about, like, uh, I think I said something about um, Joseph Gordon-Levin be Joseph Gordon-Levitt being in Inception. You don't need an Inception for Beverly Hills Cop. You just don't. You need a really good story where Axel eventually will come out on top, the winner and, and the victor, and the good guys win, the bad guys lose. That's really all you need with this. And that's what we got. And it was so good. And the music, don't even get me started, because holy crap. I do know, as of this recording, by the time you guys are hearing this, hopefully we'll actually have a release date, La La Land Records is working on getting the score together uh, from Lauren Balf and everybody else and, and all that, so I know they're working on a limited edition CD, as they always do. Uh, I've already talked to my buddy Matt over there about all that. But the way the music was put in, like you guys were saying earlier in the podcast about how they use the heat is on at the beginning, and then they use shakedown as the main kind of thing later. And whenever they can fit in the Falter Meyer classic theme, because there are certain themes in movies, animation, whatever, that you just instantly know and you instantly get excited about. And every time the Axel F theme came up, you knew something badass was going to happen in this movie. 
Yeah, they really did play every score from one and two, which Mm -hmm. was fantastic. It was really a true tribute to Beverly Hills Cop, this whole series. I mean, it was everything you could ask for with movie, plot, the way Axel Foley behaves, the old school guys, plus the new school guys. Everything about it all flowed beautifully together. The score was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, I couldn't complain about it at all. I mean, I, you know, within the first, you know, probably 10 minutes when he's in Beverly Hills, Neutron Dance kicks on, and I'm just like, okay, (laughs) it's just freaking amazing because that is such a good song, and it's reminiscent of the time where he was in the cigarette truck, except this time it's different, and it's it's still all around just great. Yeah, and I love how every time he has to go out to Beverly Hills, there's always a truck full of something somewhere. <laughs> all right, Steve, any final thoughts before I send it to a quick ad break for other podcasts that we promote here on the network? No, I think that's it. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick ad break and hear some stuff from other podcasts that we love and that we've been promoting for years. And those are the only ads you're going to hear here on the GeekCast Radio Network at this point because, yeah, we've worked that out. (laughs) So we'll be right back right after this. Hello, geeks and geekettes! Looking for a podcast that covers a vast array of topics? Then check out Altered Geek Unleashed, where we discuss our thoughts on this week's geeky news, tech, gaming, television shows, movies, cartoons, comics, and more. So, get altered, get geeky with the Altered Geeks, every Friday on the GeekCast Radio Network. Kid? Yes. Shut up. Beyond the Night is the GCRN's latest review podcast. We are covering everything in the Knight Rider television universe. From the classic 80s TV series to the 1991 reunion film, Team Knight Rider, and the 2008 relaunch series as well. So join TF2 and Mike and Dion the Music Man as they go in-depth in Beyond the Night only on GeekCast Radio Network. You can find Beyond the Night in iTunes and on www.geekcastradio.com. Good. Yes, Michael. Just keep driving. Cheerscast, the podcast where everybody knows your name. Slide up to the bar alongside Ryan Daly and a rotating cast of guest hosts as they celebrate the long-running, award-winning television series, one hilarious episode at a time. New episodes of Cheerscast drop every Thursday, part of the Fire & Water Podcast Network. Because the world needs another movie podcast. The Geek Cast Radio Network presents for your listening pleasure, The Cinema Geek. Hosted by Amanda, Kevin, Matt, and Dan. Each week we dive headfirst in the landscape of movies as we discuss movie news, play movie games, go in-depth on reviews, and even have a top ten countdown or two. Also, don't miss our director retrospective series where we review noted directors' movies film by film. Bottom line is, if you love movies and love podcasts, you need to experience The Cinema Geek. You can find us on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, or GeekCastRadio.com. For the best in science fiction, join Mark Baumgarten, Vicki Jakubowski, Zion Kiros, and Juan San Miguel on the award-winning podcast, Mark Who 42's Universe. Doctor Who, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Star Trek, and more are all fair game with Mark Who 42 which has been around since 2012 in one form or another. Mark Who 42's universe is proud to be a part of GeekCast Radio Network, the best place to get your geek on. Listen to us bi-weekly, or weekly if we have a topic relevant for you, our listeners. Mark Who 42 on GeekCast Radio Network, a match made in a galaxy near you. 
Do you like the Transformers? Yes. Do you like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Do you like IDW comics? And comic book podcasts? Then come check out Ninjas and Bots. Each week we look at an issue of Transformers or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from their IDW Comics incarnation. We drop episodes every Saturday morning. Just like the cartoons we loved as a kid. The show can be found on your favorite podcatcher and at johnreadscomics.com. See you then. Hi, I'm Dan, and I'm the host of the Rock Nerd Radio Show, which airs live on HudsonRiverRadio.com every Wednesday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It also gets backed up as a podcast, which you can find on your preferred podcasting platform. Every week on my show, I talk about all kinds of pop culture. I talk about music. I talk about movies, TV, comics, collectibles, and so much more. I also feature a guest on my show periodically, which you might enjoy. I have a couple of special segments on my show, one called The Cover Song of the Week and My Favorite Thing in the World This Week. If you think this sounds cool, check it out sometime. I hope you do. On the Simplistic Reviews podcast, we talk movies. We talk TV. We talk... Hello, Julie, what the heck are you doing? Trying to make our spot sound more exciting by adding explosions. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you could have got the point across with sound effects, not the real thing. Car, car. Download the show on iTunes or at simplisticreviews.blogspot.com. I'm sure your insurance company will cover that. No, they won't. No, they probably won't. Give us some backup. God, I missed you, Axel. All right, folks, we are back here inside Studio 2009 with myself, TFG and Mike, Steve Megatron, and the Dragon Lord Kai from Kai Dragon Media. Guys, zero to five, what are we going to give BHCAF? Steve? I would give it probably, I'm, I'm like tempted to give it a five. Mm-hmm. Just because, I don't know if it's I triple just, dog dare like, you. A lack of- I'm probably going to give it a five because the lack of just quality films I've seen in the last like couple of years. And it was just enjoyable from start to finish. Like I wasn't looking at the time. I was like, man, I really mm-hmm. want to keep watching this movie. Yep. <laughs> and I was like, oh shoot, it's over. <laughs> like, yep. I was hoping for more like Taggart and, and, uh, Rosewood. Billy and, uh, mm-hmm. Axel scenes. But I mean, I was happy with what we got, but, um, yeah, I mean, I was just was really hoping for uh, more of it. Well, I'm sure we will get more soon in a couple of years or maybe next year, whenever they're going to do the, the next one. What about you, Kai? I absolutely am giving it a five. I mean, the reason I'm giving it a five is it was a great throwback to one and two. The music, the story, everything was fine. I'm a like, lot like Steve on this. I lost track of time. And I, when it was over, I'm like, is this it? I want more. <laughs> And <laughs> it's very rare for me to sit there and be like, I really want more of this movie. A lot of times I'm looking at my watch like, oh, my God, this is boring. I couldn't find a pl- place in there where I had to stop and think, I don't want I, I'll skip this part. I mean, it was all around great. And I mean, I know it may sound biased on it to give it a five, but. There is so few movies that meet that criteria today that I feel like it was a chef's kiss, a great tribute to the series. And Eddie Murphy and cast did a tremendous job reprising their roles and bringing in the new blood and telling us kind of showing how everything's changed in 40 years, including the Lego, uh, Place car, which <laughs> cracked me up, but so that's kind of my thoughts on it. It's your price car. What are y'all, the Lego cops? That's right. That was funny. Oh man, yeah, that was so funny. Yeah, and I'm right there with you. And I will say, I, I'm gonna say this there's one scene I wish was a little bit shorter. Not saying it doesn't need to be there. I'm just saying I wish it was a little bit shorter. And that's the scene when they go to the open house with the Beverly Hills Valley girl lady. And I'm just like, shut up, please. One of the villains put a hole in her head. 
Put a hole in her knees. Put a hole in her elbow. So, oh my God, that real estate lady just. Mm, mm, mm. But at the end of the day, that's like half of a scene, half of a second. If it was just a slash half of a second less, I would be fine. I'm not taking anything off because of that. But that was the only scene where, because again, I watched the movie four times in three days or whatever it was. But um, yeah, no, five out of five. Easily. And I will say this now. There is not another movie that's going to come out. I don't know what else is coming out in 2024. For me right now, there's not another movie that could come out that could top this. There just isn't. There's only one that possibly could top it for me this year. Well, two. Thinking about Deadpool and Wolverine. And uh, Beetlejuice. And Sonic 3. Sonic Sonic 3 is coming out this year? Yeah, December. Yeah. Oh, well, okay, so you still got some good lineup this year, then. Right. Very good lineup. Yeah, we have a good lineup, but again, okay, I'll I'll give you Beetlejuice, because Beetlejuice and Beverly Hills Cop, they're they're not the same thing, obviously, but you can kind of align them a little bit. Deadpool and Wolverine and Sonic 3... There, Sonic 3 is a video game movie, and Deadpool and Wolverine is the superhero universe. I don't compare those to action movies like Beverly Hills Cop, Axel Foley, or Bad Boys, Ride or Die, or things like that. I'm saying specifically in the action genre that is not superhero, I don't think there's another action movie that's going to come out this year that's going to top this for me. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. All right, promotions. Kai, what do you want to promote? Well, I have uh, two YouTube channels. I have Kai Dragon Media, which where I uh, ever do a lot of streams for games, talk about games, review games. I also have my Dragon Slayer, where I have a talk show that talks about pop culture, movies, games, music, whatever we can think about with uh, TFG1 Mike as my co-host. And also when Steve gets the opportunity, come on, Steve, as well. And if you're not interested in that stuff, I do gardening as well. Gardening and cooking. I have Kai Dragon Gardening and Cooking on YouTube, where we have about 10 videos up right now for all sorts of gardening. You'll find, learn how to make pasta sauce later, how to can pasta or sauce, and all sorts of fun stuff as we grow through the growing season. So there's a lot of fun stuff there. And uh, I appreciate for the invitation to be on here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Steve, what about you? What do you got going on? Well, I'm still working on the new GeekCast Radio website. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, just kind of trying to catch up on various projects. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Coming up here inside Studio 2009, next time around, my buddy Dave Draper is going to be back. We're going to do a double feature movie I've only ever seen once as a child and I've never seen again because it scared the ever-living crap out of me, which, surprisingly, it also has its 40th anniversary this year. We're going to combine that with what Dave says is a really, really good movie. So we're doing a double feature of, uh, I think it's a Netflix film, I don't remember, I know it's on Netflix, but RRR. We're going to combine that with the 40th anniversary of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Oh, God. I know the fourth and Kalima. <laughs> I know the fourth and fifth film in that franchise are the worst ones, but I've never cared for Temple of Doom. And then after that, Dave and I are going to do the 35th anniversary of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I've got, and you'll probably want to the greatest to this ever. One. Yep, third film is the the best one. Uh, you'll probably want to listen to this one, Steve. I've already recorded this. Uh, episode 90 is going to be a podcast approach. With none other than Matrix Prime, Jesse Early of the TF Wire, and now another comic review podcast. And then uh, Captain Ruggles is going to do his Gamer Origins. And then Steve and I are going to do the Deadpool double feature where we talk about the first two movies leading up to uh, Deadpool and Wolverine. So that's what's coming up here inside the studio. Thank you for joining us. As we said, we're all giving Beverly Hills Cop Axel Foley a five. You can leave us feedback on the website, geekcastradio.com. You can send us email to feedback at geekcastradio.com. Any podcatcher you use out there, you can find Studio 2009 on and things like that. You can follow us on Twitter at Geekcast Radio for the network at It's Studio 2009, all one word. I am at TFG and Mike. Steve, what is your Twitter? At SCP21. And Kai? Kai Dragon Media. 
Awesome, awesome. You can check us all out on Facebook. We're all over there. And like I said, join us next time when Dave and I will be covering RRR and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. For now, I am TFG and Mike with... Steve Megatron. The Dragon Lord Kai of Kai Dragon Media. You'll hear us back in the studio soon. Perfect place. I saw it on the way over here today. It's perfect for you guys. You can go. It's very conservative and you guys will love it. Don't worry. It's nice. Trust me. Where are we going anyway? Don't worry about it. Just follow my lead. Another perfect place. You guys will love it. Trust me. That's not really your uncle's house, is it? Oh, yeah. Trust me. What? I'm not trying to start no shit. I just want a steak. Let's go. Come on, man. Look, you know me. You understand me. You know I need this, man. Don't do it, Billy. Sarge. We both know I'm going to do it. Oh, fuck it. Let's get a porterhouse. Ah, we're not talking. getting any younger, you know. Come on, let's But not it. one word to Jane, and that's an order. Oh, yeah. Not one word no, to no, Jane. No. This is going to be fantastic. Trust me.